Hello, I'm Doug Wood, the current president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and we're here today to talk about Choosing Wisely, a project that the Society has been involved in in the past year in partnership with several other specialty societies. I have with me today a panel of experts who are going to be talking about Choosing Wisely, and I'd like to start off by having each of them introduce themselves. Sean Grandin, the University of Calgary. Faisal Bakin, Houston, Texas. Robert Merritt, Columbus, Ohio. Bob Higgins, Columbus, Ohio. Tom McGilvery, Boston, Massachusetts. So I want to give first a little bit of background about Choosing Wisely, which may not be well known to many of you. So the origins of the Choosing Wisely project was a charter in medical professionalism from 2002, and this led to the Good Medicine and Stewardship Project that was led by Internal Medicine, Pediatrics, and Family Medicine in 2009, and funded by the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation. This addressed five things that were overused or inappropriately used in ordering tests or performing procedures and trying to empower patient-physician conversations to use tests and procedures more wisely. This led to the Choosing Wisely project, which was a partnership of the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, along with Consumer Reports, which is well known as a consumer advocacy group. This led to nine specialty societies having the first rollout of, of Choosing Wisely, with five elements from each of these societies uh, discussed in April of 2012. This is when the Society of Thoracic Surgeons became involved, and we developed a very organized process over the course of nearly a year before we partnered with 16 other specialty societies with five overused or inappropriately used uh, practices in cardiothoracic surgery that we wanted to educate our members about and our patients about, and this was publicly released in February of 2013. Sean Grondin, uh, our chair of the workforce of general thoracic surgery, was one of the integral members involved in helping us with the Choosing Wisely project. Sean, tell us uh, about the work in your workforce and how you went through the process of identifying with your members uh, what some possible practices were that we could identify that were overused or inappropriately used and might be areas that we should consider evaluating? Well, what we did, uh, Dr. Wood, is uh, with our group of about uh, 10 task force members, we uh, looked at uh, various um, items that we felt were uh, important to a practicing general thoracic surgeon. We essentially uh, uh, polled both our, our members who are academic and uh, community-based surgeons uh, on the, our task force and then came up with uh, 10 recommendations that we felt were uh, practical and could be also uh, measured to see that if, if we could uh, implement these, uh, then there'd be some change in practice. And uh, it was a very exciting process, actually. Our group was, uh, was very involved with this because there's several things that, as we'll be discussing, that we found are sometimes, uh, say, misused but aren't used as effectively as they could be. And so it was a great opportunity for our group to put forward some uh, ideas of what we felt would be uh, good standards to bring forward. So it was, it was a good uh, process. Well, and I have to commend you and your workforce. You did a great job of evaluating uh, possible tests or procedures that uh, we did not need to use as often as we did. And one of the Choosing Wisely principles is that the, the elements chosen needed to be within the purview of the specialty and needed to be measurable and actionable, and, and as well that they were frequently ordered and costly so that we could actually have an impact on decreasing healthcare costs as well as decreasing the unintended consequences of inappropriate testing, which we all knew, know can lead to harm for patients as it leads to additional tests or procedures that can sometimes hurt patients. So, uh, Dr. Bakin, you worked uh, in the evidence-based surgery workforce and you took some of these elements that were proposed by the workforce of adult cardiac surgery and the workforce of general thoracic surgery and 
You, you worked on one of these elements. Tell us what you did and how you evaluated the evidence for this and what our ultimate recommendation was to our surgeons. Thank you, Dr. Wood. We looked at uh, the value of performing transthoracic echocardiography after performing an aortic valve replacement procedure. We, just, we, we wanted to see whether there's enough evidence to support the practice, a common practice of performing echocardiography before discharge. Um, we felt that there was no evidence to support that. We felt that the procedure might be overused. In fact, uh, we felt that the yield was low and uh, our research and looking into this more closely, we find out that indeed there's no evidence to support this routine practice. Um, doing an echocardiography before discharge might be justified in patients who are symptomatic, in patients who might um, uh, indicate that they may have a complication or a, something that you can intervene on and reverse. However, straightforward valve replacement um, wouldn't, a patient wouldn't need to have an echocardiograph to sign off on him before discharge or her before discharge. In fact, it's even better to do the echo at one month follow-up when the anemia associated with the surgery has resolved, when the incisional pain um, has become uh, a non-issue, and when the um, left ventricular function has returned to baseline. That way you get a more accurate reading and you get a more accurate study. Um, there are exceptions that we mentioned. Uh, one other exception might be that your patient lives in a rural area, in which case you might consider doing the echo before discharge. Dr. Bakin, thank you. And I think you, you pointed out an important principle, which is that although the Choosing Wisely recommends against doing certain tests, there's always clinical reasons and exceptions why it may be appropriate in a given patient to choose that test anyway. And that's why uh, these are only recommendations to physicians that empower physician-patient discussions and dialogue about what's appropriate and what's not. And ultimately, it's individual patient and, and physician decisions on the ordering of any individual test. But this is to help empower those conversations. Dr. Merritt, you uh, reviewed the practice of brain MRI staging in patients with lung cancer. And tell me, what did you find and what did you recommend for those patients? Sure, Dr. Wood. So I reviewed the literature for uh, early stage lung cancer patients who presented with a stage one uh, lung tumor and no neurological symptoms. It's been a routine practice in our specialty to obtain brain MRIs or brain uh, CT scans uh, to rule out brain metastases. What we found is that the yield is low, less than 3%, actually had occult metastasis. So our recommendation was that it's not useful. And that's important because, as you pointed out, it was a, it's been a very frequent practice of routine brain imaging for patients with stage 1 lung cancer, yet in the absence of symptoms, uh, as I understand from what you said, it's very uncommon that we would actually discover occult brain metastases. Is that right? That's correct. So the vast majority of patients who present with early stage lung cancers without neurological symptoms, the likelihood of them actually having brain mets is very low. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, cost waste uh, in obtaining those studies in those patients. Uh, I think a routine neurological exam uh, and also, we should do stage-specific imaging of the brain. Uh, for patients with larger tumors or more advanced stage, then we should probably get a brain MRI in those patients. But if they're asymptomatic, have a small tumor, then a brain MRI probably would be low yield in, in that patient population. And you pointed out one of the important aspects, which is uh, the principle of, of physicians being accountable and good stewards of healthcare resources. And this is an opportunity for us to be thoughtful about that and maybe not order tests that have a low yield. Are there other potential unintended consequences of ordering a low yield test that might actually result in harm for the patient? Uh, well, the, uh, you know, there's relatively low morbidity or harm with the uh, brain imaging. Uh, the more specific issue is the cost, uh, particularly with uh, you know new healthcare measures coming down the road, uh, which emphasizes you know cost containment. 
And I think we need to rely more on you know, the literature or the data uh, to support getting these tests. Uh, if there's no support or it's low yield, then that situation is probably not a good test to obtain. I think a good physical exam uh, and then looking for symptoms, and then if they have symptoms and obtaining imaging at that time uh, would be appropriate. Are there other issues with uh, maybe unintended findings on a, a CT or brain MR that actually isn't metastatic disease but results in additional testing uh, that, that might impact the patient care? No, it's a very good question. Uh, you may pick up benign uh, brain tumors such as meningiomas uh, or even you know, nonspecific findings which may lead to other tests and biopsies which may increase cost. Uh, for a benign entity. So that also is a, another issue uh, with getting unnecessary tests, is to, which leads to other diagnostic tests and other you know, uh, invasive procedures. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Higgins, uh, as one of the senior officers of, of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, you know, why is it important for the STS and for our specialty to be involved in choosing wisely? Well, Doug, I think this is an important initiative for all physicians, not just cardiothoracic surgeons. And I'm proud to say that uh, our specialty, under your direction and leadership, has once again demonstrated its, uh, its part in uh, helping to improve health care and be appropriate stewards of the resources that we are so desperately uh, uh, required to preserve. I think the Society of Thoracic Surgeons once again demonstrates its leadership uh, things like uh, uh, multi-specialty database uh, uh, has been an example of a great uh, initiative that the STS has led. I think it's important for us uh, to show that we can work with other groups. And again, proud to know that we're working with multi-specialties across disciplines to help advance uh, uh, an understanding about things that could save cost and improve outcomes in uh, healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Higgins. Dr. McGillivray, you are the, uh, the council chair for uh, education and member services for STS and a prominent cardiac surgeon. How, how does this impact the practicing cardiothoracic surgeon? What's the take home message uh, for our surgeons today about how they ought to look at choosing wisely, and the, which is now published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery? Uh, how should they apply that in their day to day practice? Thanks, Doug. I think this is very important. Uh, it allows us an opportunity to continue to provide high quality care to our patients, but also being good stewards of health care resources. Uh, historically, when cardiac surgery was being developed uh, in, the, in the hope of trying to make a very high risk endeavor safe, all kinds of tests were ordered. Uh, and based on bad experiences with patients, those tests got added on to each other. And so ultimately, we had a boilerplate of tests that were done on every single patient. Uh, but we've learned a lot since then. And that what we've learned is that many of these tests aren't necessary. They don't improve the quality of care to our patients. And that they not only add to cost, but sometimes add to the inconvenience, pain, uh, and uh, complications. So I think that the take-home message to uh, the practicing cardiothoracic surgeon is that we should be able to take this information, have a conversation with our patients, and choose wisely the tests that are necessary that we know, based on good evidence, will allow us to, to do the right things for the patient, but not wasting, uh, not wasting our patient's time uh, or health care resources. Tom, that's a tr terrific summary, and, and I would just conclude by saying, you know, the society and the cardiothoracic surgeons that are leaders within the organization and work within our workforces have diligently looked at how we can provide evidence-based advice for our practicing uh, surgeons and how they can improve and empower a dialogue with their patients in things that maybe we don't need to routinely do. And you can easily find more information about choosing wisely and cardiothoracic involvement in choosing wisely on the Choosing Wisely website 
or in our own publication in the Annals of, Th of Thoracic Surgery that was published last year in 2013. Thank you for uh, all of the panel of experts that are here with us today, and I hope that all of you will continue to choose wisely. Thank you.